I'll give you the answer right away, but anybody have another idea? The soak break down things? Yeah. It breaks down the surface of the water. Because water is not, it's, it's a question of density, but also if you look at a water drop, if you look at a water drop on the table, say this is my table, or maybe here, okay? If you look at the water drop, it's going to be kind of like this. Too much water. Okay. Cool <coughs> So you guys are going to make encaustic paints in this class? Mm -hmm. Yeah? No? Yes? Mm -hmm. That's great. Now, in encaustic paints, if you want to make fallow green, do you think it's going to be floating like this one does? No. Why? Is the encaustic sort of water? I'm sorry. I don't know what I'm saying. No, you're saying good, <laughs> it's good stuff, actually. Would you be recommending the temperature? I'm sorry? Would you be recommending the different heat? Different heat? Yeah. No. I'm just asking you guys, like, when you're going to be, you know, making encaustic, you're going to melt wax, right? That's the first part. And then you're going to mix pigment in, right? Or toothpaste? How are you guys going to do it? How are they going to do it? Toothpaste or pigment? Um, we'll do it with paint. They're going to yeah. do it with paint. Oh, so you're not going to have that stuff. <laughs> but if you were to use fallow green, it wouldn't mix in. You think it would mix? I've, I've tried to color some candles on using chalk. You were using chalk and trying to color candles? Yeah. And uh, the wax you were using was paraffin or? It Uh, microcrystalline, maybe? <laughs> it was black. <laughs> it was black. So basically, I guess your chalk just went down to the bottom, and when you were stirring, uh, it would go up, but then down to the bottom, right? By the time the candle was settled, it was I'm sorry? By the time the, the candle was like setting, the... In the, in the mold, right? Yeah. Everything was at bottom, yeah. That's why you should use fallow grain. Because calcium carbonate has a density of around 3 grams per cc, so 3 times the times of water. But um, this one has a lighter density, so it wouldn't settle down the bottom. And you would be using much less. But the fact, uh, my question is like, can you, um, if you are mixing this one in your melted wax, will it mix? Because calcium <coughs> carbonate is settled, but it mixed. You know what I mean? Like it didn't stay on top. What do you think would happen with this one in the melted wax? It's okay. It's a guess. What is the density of the wax? Wow, what a good question. That's an excellent question. Melted wax is around ballpark 0 0.7, 0 0.8 grams per cc. Water is one. Water is actually what we use to you know, to, to measure, it's the measuring, you know, for kilogram and for, uh, so I answered your question, now answer mine. Would it mix? Yeah. Yes, it would, because it's a low density. So the only media where you're going to have the problem of mixing organic pigments, you know, like this, is basically in water medium. In caustic, you're not going to have this problem. Oil painting, you're not going to have this problem because all of these binders are below one gram per cc density. Well, finally, my premix is done. Is it paint? Is this paint? Yeah, it's not a binder. That's right. It's not paint until I have a binder. So in extent price, you were to like not go through breaking down the pigment or mixing it with water, 
or alcohol, but when directly to the emulsion of water and egg, egg what do you think? We, mm -hmm. it would. The only problem, the reason people aren't doing that so much is because it's fast drying. Once you mix it there, uh, it starts to dry really, really fast. That's the reason we don't do it, but we could do it if we want to. So, so if you guys can see, it's still very lumpy, you know? Because it's always going to be hard to mix the pigment uh, in the water like that, as opposed to this one, which is already fine. There has to be an easier way to mix organic pigments, you know, to make artist oil, artist paint. I used to say artist oil paint. Anyway, I'm just going to make the watercolor now. With gum Arabic. Just going to add a little binder here. And basically, you guys were asking me what are the proportions to make and paint. And that's a good question. But the only answer to that question is you need to use as much binder as you need to use to get what you want. Because when you guys are buying a tube of paint, you never ask how much binder is inside. You're just trusting that they made the right choice. So when you are making your paint, you need to have enough binder so that the paint is, you know, as fast as possible. Enough that the, the paint, you know, adheres well here. So basically, you can do that by eye. Now I'm just making the watercolor. Just with my paintbrush, I'm just taking my pigment dispersion here into the gum Arabic, and I have oops, I have the watercolor now. I'm sorry. They're just telling themselves. They're telling something. They're just telling each other about the gum Arabic. Yes. Gum Arabic can also be found in uh, in food food products sometimes. Though it's a little expensive for food, but it can be. I buy it. I messed up. I buy a food grade. That's the cleanest grade you know, I can get. So. I'm just going to write what this is. Watercolor. Did you put the gamerbic right into the pigment, or are you putting it beside it just to make Absolutely. a small portion? Absolutely. Yeah, I could have put right there, and I'm going to do it to you right away. But if I want to put the gum arabic straight into the pigment, I need to use... There's only one I could do that with, right? Only one class of pigment I can mix straight in, and which one would that be? The organic? No. Yeah, yeah. Because it has to have a higher or equal density because if I put it straight into the uh, organic, it's going to work a little better than with my water, but it's still going to be uh, very difficult. Okay. So before putting that, and I have some other questions, sorry. Before That's putting okay. gum arabic in the green one, it was after you mixed it with the alcohol and soap? Alcohol, soap, and water. Did you mix all three before putting it in? Yeah, in the end, I ended up mixing everything together. Does that matter, or did no? It? Okay. But, but you could just put alcohol and mix it. Together. Yes, that would have been the easy way. But in this demonstration, of course, the goal is not to make it easy. It's really to show you everything that can happen and how it's done at a smaller scale. But basically, if I was making a batch in production. I would have my pigment, I would have my surfactant and water, then I would mix it like that, and of course I wouldn't use any alcohol. Okay. So, what about cobalt turquoise light? Can I use this one to do a straight? Oh, I give me a sec. Say That's okay. <laughs> cobalt turquoise light. That would be as metal, so it's inorganic. So can I can I do a straight with the gum arabic straight watercolor? I need water in it. I'm sorry. Yeah, there's water in it. Yeah, but can I can I use this pigment straight 
with the gum Arabic binder here. Who says no? You say no? Why are you saying no? That's okay. <laughs> you are thinking it's not going to mix because it's an organic pigment, right? You're thinking it's yeah. light, right? Yeah. Actually, because it has the name cobalt, it's cobalt turquoise B, the light. So it contains this one, cobalt. So it's one of the inorganic, one of the heavy ones. As soon as you have a melanin, titanium, cobalt, cadmium, zinc, these are all heavy pigments, so they will mix straight into water medium right away. Did I, did I make it more clear for you? Yes. Right. So, I'm just going to use this part here. Come out of it. It's no longer than this. That's how you should do it in the studio, of course, very fast. You make sure all the pigment is wet with the binder. And if you wanted to, you could further, you know, grind it. The rule is, basically, if you grind it more, the paint is going to be, has more tinting power. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah, let me speak first. Yeah, okay. <laughs> if you're going to grind it more, you have more tinting power, okay? Uh, and the paint is going to be more vibrant and everything. But, the rule <coughs> is, basically, if I do all of this extra mixing, am I going to see a difference with my eyes? That's the rule. Because people often ask, how much should I mix? How much pigment should I have? And you know, what not? And I always, my answer to this is always the same. It's basically, can you see a difference when you do that extra mixing? You know, in my case, I'm, I find that just mixing like this is perfectly good enough, you know, for what I want to do. So it's not true that you need to be grinding and mixing for hours when you are making Yeah. Um, when well, you're mixing it on the on whatever you're mixing it, and then you you start to paint, and then that dries. Like, can you add something to it to make it come to life again, or do you have to remix and stick it again? Okay, that's a very good question. How how you can when it dries, how you can keep working with it, right? Like, like as opposed to it being in a tube like this, for example. Yeah, because it'll dry out plastic or well, in the case of gum arabic, this really isn't a problem because gum arabic is a resoluble binder. You know, when you add water to gum arabic, it's coming back again. All watercolors and wash are that way because the binder is resoluble. So, what we used to do, uh, my teacher, Karen uh, Picatro, was a very was an artist I really liked, you know, his painting, so I, I would visit him in the studio, and what he had was he had a piece of glass with all dry swatches of watercolored washes and whatnot, and before he started, he would just put water on all of them and start again. But if you wanted to, uh, basically you could prove it yourself. We sell the empty tubes. But in the case of watercolor, it's basically we make what we need when we need. I'm going to give you an, exact, an idea, okay? This is cobalt turquoise light. This is a color you will never be able to buy downstairs, for example, where they have like student grade. Buy that real pigment, you can't do that here. But if you were buying a tube of oil paint of that, you'd be paying around 40 bucks. Approximately for like this size. We sell the double size of this for I think around 23 or something. I have to look at it. So basically, you just make what you need, and when you're finished, I mean, you can, it's great if you keep it, but it's not like it's costing, when you're making your paint, it's really not costing so much. So, you know, I mean, I used to have, I was mainly oil painting, so I had a piece of glass like this in my studio, 
and I would make a paint, and then I had all my blobs of paint, and then when they were dry, I would take this and I would just open it and then take the paint from inside. You know what I mean? I would just let it dry. So different artists have different ways. Uh, some of my customers tube their paint. They make paint and then they tube it. That's fine. All right. So. Uh, that's a good question. That's expensive. <laughs> it's expensive. I mean, you go to the restaurant, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know the difference between a restaurant meal and a home meal? I mean, both of them is food, right? <laughs> the scenery? The what? The scenery? Scenery. <laughs> scenery, yeah, that's the true. Experience? Like the the experience. experience. It's just serving. It's just well, that's basically what you're paying for when you get a tube too. You're paying for, you know, someone else has made it for you. But basically, when you cook at home, it's real cheap, isn't it, compared to what you pay to get a restaurant? Depends. It depends. If you get your recipe the first time around, you know, if you, yeah, it's kind of cheap. So basically, that's that's the reason, you know, when you are making tube, when you are making paint. You have to pay to the store, you know, you have to pay to the wholesaler, you have to pay freight, you have to pay regulation, labels, boxes, labor, insurance. I know. I'm making paint, so I know. That's what drives the pain, the price of the pain too up. And that was the reason I had always been making my pain, because I wasn't going to buy a tube of $40. But I also like the paint with, you know, very nice color. That's the reason I started doing my paints back then. So I got three watercolors. I'm just going to label the last one. All right. So maybe we can pass it around. Okay. These are the three watercolors I did. Everybody has a oh, yes, perfect. If you were to take one of those small jars full of pavement and you were to mix everything, the whole jar, like, say you were making some oil paints in one of those jars, yeah. how much oil would you have in the end of the mix? Basically, with a small jar, I'd say a little bit over a 37 ml tube. Because uh, they are 50 ml jars, so basically the, the paint you'd have, if you were to just do that, would be more concentrated than what you used to buy, basically. Because it doesn't contain, it wouldn't contain any cell. Another question? No? So, everybody, yes? I had a question for earlier, but I forgot to ask it. When you mix the yellow, you added water, then did you put the gum in there? Gum Arabic, yes, I did. But with the cobalt, you just put gum Arabic? Straight. I could have done that with the yellow okay. if I wanted, but I wanted to oppose the two pigments in the water so you guys could understand. But if I had done with the yellow straight, it would have worked. Okay. Now, does everybody understand uh, organic and organic and toxicity? Now, why is titanium Y non-toxic and cadmium would be toxic? Why do you think I can say that? See how strong this is? <coughs> Yellow ochre, iron oxide, not toxic, right? Right? Am I, yes? No, it's not toxic. Yeah, but if you are like eating rust, there's a chance you're also heating. Um, if you are thinking rust, rust is toxic, there's a good chance that there are other things with it as well. But the iron oxide, not a toxic. Rust isn't that toxic, it's just ugly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you guys know what uh, heavy metal is? Heavy metal, what it is, what it means? 
It's a magazine, yes. The fantasy magazine. 